Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on sound waves. The topic of this video is natural frequency, force vibration, and resonance. And we want to know how can the natural frequency of a vibrating object be controlled and what is resonance and under what conditions does it occur. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. Sound waves are produced by a vibrating object. When an object is struck or hit or plucked or strummed or somehow disturbed, it begins to vibrate with either a single frequency or a set of frequencies known as its natural frequencies. The fact is that an object, when it does vibrate, usually vibrates with more than one frequency at once, and the quality or timbre of a sound is dependent upon the mixture of frequencies with which the vibrating source is vibrating. Let's consider three different types of objects. The first is the everyday run-of-the-mill pencil dropped on the floor. Upon contact with the floor, the pencil begins to vibrate and we would hear the sound waves. It typically vibrates with a number of different frequencies and for illustrative purposes, I've listed five example frequencies. For instance, it may vibrate at 197 hertz, 211 hertz, 217 hertz, 289 hertz, and 329 hertz. It's not too difficult for me to convince a person that there's no clear mathematical relationship among these frequencies. For instance, you wouldn't look at one of them and say, aha, look, that's twice the other one. In such a situation, the sound of the drop pencil would sound rather noisy to the ear. Now let's contrast the drop pencil with the musical instrument known as the flute. The flute has a reputation of playing a single frequency when it's played. So when you play the flute at 200 hertz, that's about all that you get. We refer to the flute as being a pure sounding musical instrument. And finally, let's contrast the drop pencil and the flute with the tuba. The tuba has a reputation of when you play it at 200 hertz, there's a collection of overtones that play along with that 200 hertz sound. And typically the collection of overtones have frequencies of 400 hertz, 600 hertz, 800 hertz, and 1000 hertz. And it's not too difficult for me to convince a person that there are rather clear mathematical relationships among the frequencies that are found in the mixture of frequencies produced by the tuba. For instance, the 400 hertz is two times the 200 hertz. The 600 hertz is three times the 200 hertz and three halves times the 400 hertz. The 800 hertz is four times the 200 hertz, four thirds times the 600 hertz, and two times the 200 hertz, and so forth. In such a situation, we would refer to the tuba as being musical because there's a clear mathematical relationship among the frequencies, and we would also describe it as producing a rich set of sounds. The natural frequency or set of frequencies at which an object vibrates is dependent upon two main factors. It depends upon the speed at which vibrations travel through the object and also upon the wavelength established in that object. That's not the surprising because after all, the frequency is equal to the speed divided by the wavelength. Let's consider three illustrations of how the natural frequency can be controlled by controlling the speeds. Let's begin by discussing the guitar. On the guitar are six guitar strings, and if you look closely, you'll notice that they're made of different materials, that they have different densities, and there's a peg that you can use to tighten or loosen up the tension in the string. Now this all makes sense because as you tighten the tension of the string, you cause the speed of vibrations traveling through that guitar string to increase and you'll produce higher frequencies and higher pitches. And if you select a higher density string, the speeds at which vibrations travel in that string will be less than in a lower density string, and the result is the high density strings produce lower vibrational frequencies and lower pitches. As a second example, let's consider the famous singing water goblet. And you're lucky enough that I have brought in my water goblet today, and I'm going to make it sing for you. I do it by getting my finger wet and then sliding it across the rim of the water goblet. And when I do, the glass begins to vibrate and produce a sound that is audible to the air. Now I can control the natural frequency at which it vibrates by emptying some of the water 
out of the water goblet. And as I do, I cause the speed at which vibrations travel within the glass to increase, and the result is I will produce higher frequencies. And just to convince you that it is the case, let me empty all of the water out of the water goblet. And there you see how we can use speed to control the frequency at which that water goblet vibrates. As a final illustration, let's consider your so-called vocal folds or vocal cords part of your vocal track. When you tighten up those vocal cords, you cause the speed of weight vibrations within the vocal cords to increase and you can produce higher frequency sounds with the tightening of those vocal cords. On the other hand, if you relax them and make the tension less, just like the guitar string, the speed of vibrations within the vocal cords decrease and the frequencies become lower and so do the pitches. Over the course of time as you age, your density or mass of those vocal cords begin to increase as you mature. And the result is that they, the speed of vibrations begin to decrease as well, and your voice begins to lower in frequency and in pitch and deepens, and, and you get a deeper voice. The natural frequency of a vibrating object is also dependent upon the dimensions of the object, mainly the length, since larger objects tend to vibrate with longer wavelengths and, according to our equation, thus producing lower natural frequencies. For many objects, the natural frequency at which it vibrates is inversely proportional to the length of the object. Let me illustrate with four examples from the world of music. In our first example, let's consider the guitar string that has strings of a fixed length, but you can take a string and finger it to a fret and make the effective length of that vibrating string less. A, a shorter string will vibrate with a higher frequency and thus be heard as a higher pitch. As a second example, let's consider the, the trombone. The trombone has a slide that we can extend. As we extend the slide, the length of vibrating air within the trombone increases and thus the pitch and frequency decreases. The third example would be the recorder. The recorder has a collection of holes that we cover with our fingers and by covering them we can manipulate the length of air within that recorder that undergoes vibration and thus affect the natural frequency at which it vibrates. And as our last example, let's consider the straw. Yes, the plastic straw. You wouldn't believe me if I told you, so I'm not going to tell you. Instead, I'm going to show you the principle behind the musical instrument known as the straw. I have a straw here, and what I'm going to do is take a scissors, and I'm going to taper the end of that straw so that the end of the straw can begin vibrating as I blow air through the straw. And then, without anyone standing in the way of my air, I'm going to put my lips on that little tapered end and blow. Quite musical indeed. Now, I can affect the frequency at which this vibrates by changing the length of the straw. You'll notice when the length gets smaller and smaller that the frequencies will get higher and higher. And I do that with the scissors. To understand the concept of resonance, you need to understand the idea of a force vibration. A force vibration occurs when one vibrating object forces a connected vibrating object into vibrational motion. To illustrate, I'd like you to consider a guitar string. If you had a guitar string and you pulled it really tight and you had a friend come in and plug it, the guitar string would begin vibrating and you'd hear a sound, but it would not be a loud sound. Similarly, you could take the tines of a tuning fork, you could tap it on a rubber bridge or hit it with a rubber mallet, and the tines would begin vibrating and you'd hear the vibrations, but it wouldn't be very loud, it couldn't be heard from some distance away. But if you took that guitar string and you attached it to a guitar, 
into the sound box of a guitar. When the guitar string begins to vibrate, the sound box begins to vibrate. The air inside of the sound box begins to vibrate and everything begins vibrating with the, in sync with that vibrating string. The result is you're vibrating enough here to hear a loud enough sound that everybody in the room can hear. Similarly, you take the tines of the tuning fork and you, you mount the tuning fork on a soundboard. The tines of the tuning fork vibrate. It's connected to the soundboard. The soundboard vibrates the air inside, the air outside. Everything vibrates in sync with the tines of the tuning fork. And now you have amplified the sound by means of a force vibration and you hear a loud sound. Resonance occurs when one vibrating object forces a second object to vibrate at the same natural frequency. Resonance is often demonstrated in the physics classroom using two identical tuning forks mounted up on wooden soundboards. Tuning fork A is, is struck and set into vibrational motion and after about 10, 15, 20 seconds of vibration it stopped and pulled away and everybody hears that tuning fork B, the one that was not hit, is now vibrating. What happened? Well, tuning fork A has forced tuning fork B into resonance. They share the same natural frequency, they're very close to one another, so sound waves emitted by tuning fork A impinge upon tuning fork B and set it into vibrational motion. Resonance can also be demonstrated in the classroom with, a three, with three sets of inverted pendula having varying length and varying natural frequency. When you pluck the red, when you get the red pendulum bob, vibrating, it sets the other red pendulum bob into vibrational motion. The same is true with the yellow pendulum bob and with the green pendulum bob. But what never happens is the red bob never forces the yellow bob to begin vibrating. They don't share the same natural frequency. The red and the red share the same natural frequency, so red forces red to vibrate, yellow forces yellow to vibrate, and green forces green to vibrate. Whenever you have resonance occurring, the result is a big vibration. And if the vibrations create sound waves that are audible, the result is also a loud, sustained sound. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are four resources you'll find on our website, and I've left links to each of them in the description section of this video. You have two YouTube videos you'll enjoy watching. There's a Minds on Physics mission on the topic of resonance, and then lesson four from our written tutorial. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.